Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Russell Dethridge. I am a senior principal consultant at LHH, Lee Hecht Harrison, and I've been working with them for just over five years now. But however, I've been working as, I suppose, a people consultant for just about 22 years. And in that time, I've seen lots of different changes in the way people work at a a personal level and a team level and also in an organizational level and also what they want to gain from their careers. So it's going to be my pleasure today as Russell to take you through um, this session on taking control of your career. So let us just begin and uh, just saying hello to people in uh, the chat. I'll tell you what we'll do just so we can make this interactive. Let me just take that down. In the chat function, what I'd like you to do is to put in, so in the chat rather than the Q&A session, in the chat function, what I'd like you to do is to put in, um, here's a question. If a five-year-old child were to stop you and ask you, what was your job? What job did you do? Or do you do? What would your answer be? So imagine you're talking to an average five-year-old child and they stop you in the street, if they did. Um, how would you describe your job to them? What would that be? So I'm just going to leave that in the chat function for a while. So in the chat function, if a five-year-old child stopped you in the street and said, hey, what do you do? What would your response be? I help people to do their job. I look after robots. Thank you. Um, I give people support. I tell how much people can. I create lessons for adults. I tell people about the really interesting things they can learn at university. I pay people. I support people. I experiment. I help people. I pay people. I love. The, I like the the job. I pay people. I work with lots of big numbers. Excellent. So if the child was then to say to you, "Oh, well, that's fantastic. That's amazing. What you do? How did you get there?" How did you decide that you wanted to pay people? You wanted to um, help people at university. Um, I want to help people understand each other. So if the child asked you a second question, what would your response be to that? How did you arrive at where you are today? So in the chat function, just put that in again. So I've helped people to make their jobs easier. Fantastic. I don't know. I winged it. A happy accident by chance. I did it once and I liked it. Thank you, Manisha through lots of hard work from Jenna there. It just happened. A very happy accident through training, by hard work. I asked people to get debt free, remind them to pay their invoices. That's answer to the first question. I love seeing people grow and it looked interesting. Thank you, Claire Chalmers. By knowing, um, always being honest and, and hardworking, plus, lots, plus lots, lots of luck. Thank you, Sebastian. Great. The reason I ask those two questions is sometimes we don't quite track how we've arrived at where we are today. And sometimes we get so caught up in what we're doing, we count, as Simon Sinek described, how we do it, and perhaps most importantly, why we do something. So today, for the next 57 minutes or so, what I'd like you to be Regardless of what your rank is, wherever you work, your seniority, whatever it is, I want you to be an employee, wherever you are. I want you to see the next uh, just under an hour as you thinking about your career and maybe taking that thinking and helping other people afterwards, but really thinking about it from your own perspective. So I love, I've just seen Gemma Rooks there. I was interested in people and wanted to focus on this in my job. So looking at other people. Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. So let's take a view forward. So as you know, my name is Russell Dethridge. I have no idea what the provenance of my surname is, other than it scares people if I check into a hotel late on a Sunday night. Um, and today, as you'll have seen in the invite, what we're looking at is how the pandemic has changed many people's career priorities. And this session is looking at how we can help people kind of get through the woods, get through all the different kind of uh, fog and, and so on that sometimes surrounds us, especially at the moment where maybe, I don't know, maybe all if, the, if we, we work in a kind of a snow globe and the snow has been shaken up in the last two years, maybe, just maybe it's settling a bit and see where we can go next. So I'll be looking at about three or four things today. 
what steps can you take to recognize different career options? Then, how can you manage multiple career interests effectively through a portfolio of careers? Now, the reason I've inserted that into this session is I run a lot of uh, sessions such as Career Focus, uh, another partner one called uh, Talent Builder, which is for managers. And in the last year, I've noticed when I've asked people what their career ambitions are, many of them are saying, well, maybe I don't want to work five days a week for the same organization anymore. Being at home for 18 months now, two years, has changed the way I see my relationship to my employer. And I think this is really interesting. Where people are lo located, clearly, is, is different. The times, perhaps, if people were in furlough, they, they thought differently about what they're doing. And I think that is now starting to show some evidence. You'll have seen, I'm sure of you, or heard of the great resignation wave. We're also starting to see, I only have this anecdotally from my clients, the, the rebound is happening, though the boomerang effect is happening. People are starting to, to come back. So that idea of portfolio careers is also an emerging issue. And what conversations do you need to have with your employer? As I mentioned before, if you just firmly put on the, the hat of being an employee today, um, you can maybe take some of the learnings to apply to yourself and maybe afterwards apply to other people. Okay, so thank you. Let's move forward then. So different career options. Who looks outside, dreams? Who looks inside, awakes? Whenever I'm coaching or I'm running a session like this, sometimes these sessions take... Um, about half a day, sometimes a full day, when we go into, into things in greater depth. Um, I start with a quote like this, which is understanding ourselves. Now, it's great in the, um, the chat, people were sharing um, their journey to how they got here today in their career. But sometimes we have to look at, did we arrive by accident in a fortunate way, which some people did, and sometimes with maybe having gone down different paths we perhaps didn't want to before. Now then, I'm going to put up some quotes in just a moment from this person who's just thinking, and I'd like you to annotate on the screen which one rings true for you. Now, before I bring the quotes up, what I'd like to do is to introduce you, if you don't know already, to the annotate button, the famous Zoom annotate button um, that can give us an indication of people's preferences. So if you take your um, cursor to the top of the screen. Sometimes it's at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a, uh, a green bar, I think, that says you are uh, viewing Russell's shared screen. If you go to the right of that, it says view options. And on there, it should say in the drop down, annotate. If you click on annotate, there will be a stamp line. There's a check mark in mine, there's an arrow, a tick mark, a cross, a star, a heart and a question mark. So just before we start, what I'd like you to do is to find that annotate and just play around with the buttons that you've got. Okay. Okay, never mind. Don't worry about that. I thought we'd have that, but it doesn't matter at all. What we can do is instead of going on to the Zoom annotate, I can see people don't have it. That's fine. What I'll do is I just want you to read the slides that are coming up or read the quotes that are coming up and which one you identify with. So don't worry about the Zoom, don't worry about that. Um, was this one you identified with? No one told me about the opportunity. I didn't even know it was posted. HR doesn't help with career moves, there's a one. Don't worry about the annotate. If I do get a job, oh, sorry, if I do a good job, I'll get promoted. I'm waiting for my manager to tell me what, should my, what my career move should be. She knows best. And finally, my manager doesn't talk to me about my career goals. So of those five, I've just selected these at random. In the chat function, which one do you recognize most? Either from yourself, if you want to do that, or do you hear in the organizations where you are um, most regularly?
And number three. Okay. It's great. But all people think it's somebody else's responsibility. Many of them, some saying no, they don't. Let's take a look at that. Some say no, they don't. Okay, thank you. This is really good. This is, I always start with a session like this, because once I was, before I, I worked for LHH, I was holding a, a career conversation with a group of people. And I said, what's your approach to, to, to developing any career? And some people say I'm very structured, I'm this, that, the other. Other people, one guy said, I just go with the flow. I just go with the flow. And I thought, oh, that's, that's okay. And then another participant said, the only problem with that is dead fish tend to go with the flow and you might end up somewhere that you don't intend. And that's always struck me. And it occurred to me that we need, actually, this was some years ago, all of us need to move into this idea of career helium. Let me just move on. Because, and I'll come to that in a moment, because if you think about the word career, it can have two meanings. There's the career, a car careering off a road, as we can see here. So it just goes crash, bang, wallet. So we can go anywhere. Or when we look at what a career is, we look at what education we have and what that inspires us to do, the skills that we already possess, or the ones that we want to maintain. Our values, often people, when they're looking at career or career change, don't really consider what they mean by values and how they come to life and how they match with a potential or current employer. When we look at our interests, I think this is really key as well. What are our interests now? What are our, our short-term motivations now? And what are the things for the future? Our goals, naturally those can change with outside interests, so on and so forth, but kind of our medium-term goals, what do they look like? And what's our experience, both inside and outside the workplace? So we can either go from career, career, a car careering off the edge of a cliff, or take control of certain things. So let's take a look. I mentioned before about who is responsible for our um, career. And I think there are three areas. First of all, as we've seen in the chat, there's employee accountability. Then there is um, the enabling by management level as well. And I want to thank my colleague, Tim Edwards, who ran a session just over a day ago, about 25 hours ago, when he looked at the how managers can make and enable those um, career-focused sessions. Very powerful it was as well. I think are there are um, some slides that you could request for both this session and yesterday's as well. And then there's the organizational support that we give. And of course, if we map those together, if we bring these together, it gives us this partnership model, a partnership of career development. I, as the employee, am not sitting there with my arms folded, waiting for the organization to give me the next uh, move, but neither am I left alone to drift and maybe uh, get lost in a little way. So in terms of accountability for ourselves, where we are today being employees, there are setting our career goals having the self-awareness to self-assess what works and what doesn't, to be on the front foot of skills building and brand building. Oftentimes people push back on that word brand. I can understand it because it can sometimes sound two-dimensional, but I think as we all know with organizations being much more matrix and much flatter, now, how we network together is important, which brings us to network building. So that's ourselves, those five or so areas are areas that we need to look at. But then also we have from the manager as well, being able to coach people during their career progression, how to have ongoing conversations and allow exposure of their line reports to things that will stretch them, but also will enable them to grow. What learning opportunities can the manager uh, distill and how can they support the line reports career goals? Really interesting, I find, of all the areas, hopefully you can see my little wand that's floating around the slide, career coaching conversations are probably the ones many line managers find the most difficult, and I'm including disciplinaries and so on, 
people know with the disciplinary they might be nervous about it but they know with the disciplinary there is a structure and there's a rhythm to them and they, they work in a particular way but with career coaching it's when I've been working with line managers at any level it's always the area where people think I don't want to ask and I think that's a shame because we can sometimes lose people just check in a quick question here thank you thank you Marie you can see the little dot and then finally we have the overall organizational piece what programs are um, allow people to connect with each other what mentoring is available what networking pieces available for people and organizationally at an organization level level what stretch assignments can be used so let's move forward then a great book by david thompson you may have heard of this called career helium going back a few years now how to float past others in your quest to reach the top or to reach what is right for you as David uh, Thompson says there, we rise to the level of our goals and we fall to the level of our daily interactions. So if you see it as uh, the image that we've got here is a balloon, the tail looking at reward and recognition and achievement, how do we connect with all of these areas when we're looking at developing our career, our immediate line manager, what the expectations of ourselves and the organization are, what's our profile within the business or the organization, um, how do we network both inside and outside the organization? And what are the politics as well with a small p rather than party politics? So take a look here. Politics, how things really get done, really understanding the organization. Networking, active, who knows you? Who do you know? Um, who are your close business relationships? Your profile, how are you perceived? As the famous Jeff Bezos once said, uh, your reputation is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Are you setting realistic expectations for yourself? Um, for the manager, do you directly commit to work with them to support them in their objectives and work in a similar way? Now, I won't ask you to put anything in the chat function for this, but just reflect for yourself when it comes to your career and where you want to take your career, how do you fare against politics, networking, profile, expectations, and your relationship with your manager? Do you know how things really get done? Now then, you'll see at the top of the screen, there's also a Q&A function. If you've got any questions so far about this model, the David Thompson model, or anything we've talked about so far, just drop me a, a line and I can uh, start to answer it. So, any questions so far? Okay, can always come back to that in a moment. Oh, we've got something here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. So let's now move on. This idea, ah, some questions have just come in. Uh, the answer, um, Andrea, is uh, yes, we can. We will be sharing the slides. Um, and there's another question here. How would you recommend getting a better grip on the politics of an organization? I feel quite shielded from this. The first thing I would look at uh, for the person who's asked that question, let me just go back a slide, just so we, everything makes sense. So the person who's asked that, first of all, I would look at when it comes to politics, how is the organization structured? And you can look at any model for that, or, or what is the culture? Is this a highly matrixed culture where things are quite flat and the decision-making uh, process is quite organic or is it so I mean what's his name Charles Handy going back many many years he would say that's kind of the net the, the kind of the flatter structure or is this quite a hierarchical uh, role-based culture where we have to apply for permission to make decisions we have to go up the way as you might see in the uh, in the armed services or the support services so first of all I'd look at the structure 
Secondly, and, and within that, secondly, I would then look at um, how decisions get made. I then drill in a bit further on how people influence each other. Is this, to continue with the Charles Handy model, is this kind of a power culture, the spider at the centre of things, and we all have, have sharp elbows and so on? And I would also look at what creativity is there as well, um, how people can use their flair. Do they have um, an ability to really open up their dialogue and so on? So going back to my correspondent here, um, I think that's where I would start. An Another piece to do would, would be to look at building a, um, a stakeholder map and sharing it with perhaps with somebody that has worked there for some time saying, these are all the key decision makers, I think, to help me develop my career. Who is missing from this? So we've got uh, Manisha, politics and networking seem to be persistent areas for development. How do we decide how much is enough? Manisha, can I just ask you to come off mute if you can. I'm not sure if you're able to, but if you can come off mute, um, that would be great. I just, I just didn't get what you mean by how do we decide how much is enough. Graham, are people able to come off mute or not? No, they're not. Okay, okay never mind. Um, so going back to Manisha's politics and networking seem to be persistent areas for development. How do we decide how much is enough? I think if I've got your question correct, is how far, far are we developed? Uh, for me, I think I'll separate the two. I think networking is going to get uh, is going to be more and more of an issue for people to to deal with as we move forward. Um, I think the more connected you are, uh, the better the the more on the front foot you will be with your career development. I think the word itself when it comes to networking is, can be quite, what's the right word? It can be a bit undermining because people think of a networking event where you're standing there in a huge hotel room with a sticker on your lapel with your name badly scrawled on it, a glass of tepid white wine and some sort of volavon that you're not going to eat. And stand there thinking, why am I at this networking event? Well, it's not really that. Networking is really about attending all sorts of events, working with people and sharing what you can give each other and what they can give to you. So hopefully, and I think politics is something else. I think politics will always be there, office politics. I don't think that's a piece for development. I think it's about how organizations look at their culture and how they promote people. So how do you handle imposter syndrome with regards to your profile? Often people perceive you very differently to how you see yourself. I think using, if you can, using a good 360 or a, what's the right word, or, or a relaxed version of that, where you're asking people about how you're, um, you're perceived. There was, yeah, I, th I think what you can do, even if you've not got an official uh, 360, what you can do is to say, this, this is my intent. How do other people perceive me? And have that as part of the way of networking. Um, and, and connect in with other people when you're, what's the, what, what am I trying to say? and connect with people about how they perceive you. The reason I was hesitating there is one of the activities we'll do in a moment is called SOAR, S-O-A-R, about how you look at how well you've done in the past. And you can share those with people and say, what did you get from me when I was working on that particular issue? Okay, so there's a few more. I'm just aware of time, just 20 past. So some great questions here, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christine. I think the approach shows that individuals need to reflect and take action as to what's appropriate for them. Um, do you think that career pathways have had their day in this volatile debt? Interesting point. M my immediate answer to that, that question about career pathways is, I don't know yet. But what I am seeing when I talk to clients is, they, some of them, I would say about a third of my clients I'm talking to at the moment, are saying, we're moving away from career pathways. And they are quite on the front foot with that. Others are saying, we are thinking about it, and others are staying, saying exactly where they are. Sure. 
Yeah, and it's a lovely question there. I have issues with the how well are you perceived. Having a career shouldn't depend on a popularity contest. You can't be um, everybody's best friend. And the, my correspondent says, does that make absolutely make sense? I think it's not supposed to be about, hey, look at me, I'm the best person ever. It's actually about people being seen and heard for the right things. I think if we're not, then that can, in a way, undermine us, especially when things are moving too fast. And we've got another one here. Often companies try and pretend politics, politics don't exist within their company uh, because of perceived negative connotations. How can we have open and honest conversations about it as part of a career discussion? There is an overlap here with the networking section. Absolutely. So thank you. I'm not sure of the person there. My, my take on that is it's sort of outside of career conversations to begin with. I think how you talk about politics within an organization starts at a team level, no matter whether you've got a team of one or you've got a team of 10, whatever it is. And people often don't do this is to talk about not only what they're going to do, but how they're going to do it and Simon Sinek, why they're going to do it and what will enable them and what will push them back. And that brings the idea of culture and how decisions get made, which brings into politics. So how do we maneuver through that? Now there's some great questions here. Sorry, I haven't got time to answer all of them. I just want to move on to some other things and I'll try and come back to them a little bit later. So career sweet spot. When we look at our values and our passions and we have to sit down, one of my correspondents just there said, how do we recognize um, who we are and what we want to do? We have to sit down sometimes with a pad and paper and a beverage of your own choice and sit down and work out what am I passionate about and what do I value in the way I show up for work? I was employed somewhere and I worked, on, worked out on day two. I was in completely the wrong place because the values of that organization did not more or less in any way match the values of my, the way I wanted to work. So looking at our achievement, our adventure, our creativity, our helpfulness, our responsibility, our service and our freedom when we are looking at who we are. Where can we add most value? So if we work out those things, maybe, as we can see on the right, we love music, but we can't sing. Gifted with technology, however, so maybe become a Grammy winning music producer. We're working within what we have. Love film, but can't act. Extremely organized, however, CEO of a film logistics company. And love technology, but can't code. But I'm great with people, head of sales for an IT uh, firm. So those are kind of some big out there pieces. There might be people who are in those jobs on the call today. But it's working out where our values and passions and where we have our skills add most value. Just going to check in with the chat function. Oh, there's a lovely, uh, a lovely question um, in the chat function rather than the Q and A. What about for people who keep their head down and work but don't feel comfortably publicly promoting themselves to others? That's something as a coach I come across quite a lot, and there is no point in me saying. Um, as a facilitator of uh, people development and so on, we need to be authentic and then saying to people, okay, now be something that you're not. But it's taking that idea, if somebody is quite reserved and quite shy, a uh, member of my family is exactly that sort of person, how do we then promote that person? I don't mean kind of in, in stepping up the way, how do we promote that person um, in a way that is comfortable for them. So that's where if I were their line manager, I'd be having quite detailed conversations about what they're comfortable with. And going back to that model about being seen and heard. So bringing them in to meetings perhaps and giving them five minutes where they present something and you get their name out and you speak of them. Um, or that you get them to speak for themselves as well. I do think, however, there is Certainly, I mean, I, I left college in 1985, and back then there was a hierarchy to any career progression, much more so than there is now. And I think people need to, to recognize that some of being on the front foot and some networking is required. It's a question here. How will you advise if someone is having a difficult relationship with their manager and feels like they can't speak with them about it? Really good question. Let me have a think about that, and I'll come back to it. It's a, 
anonymous person just there. Okay, so sorry if I haven't got to your question so far. I just want to move on to some more practical things as well. So looking at career journeys, Many people I work with often say, I've always wanted to do this, but we don't sit down with a sheet of paper and do some of the basic things. When we're looking at where we want to take our career, it's important wherever we are to look at where we've come from. So I've just made this one up. This is not me. This is just a pretend person I looked at. So maybe they left school, they left university, left uh, further education. And the first job they got was to join a training delivery company um, and got a promotion fantastic doing really well but then they take a promotion at a new company bad move values not matched so what do we learn from that and the move to leadership to another leadership development company doing pretty well um, a merger provides promotion but then they leave the merger because that merger didn't work out for them maybe the organization was way too big and then have a complete change of career and become a fitness instructor so you've got these kind of various things I would ask you after this session, whenever you want, it's not homework, you don't have to do it, but after the session, maybe thinking about looking at the highs and lows of your career journey and look at what are the common themes at the highs and lows? What can you learn from them? Did you drive the changes? Were they done to you? What could you adjust in the future? And what next? what's next for you? All of us, whether we are a CEO of a company or have just entered um, straight out of school and just in the, the job market, wherever we are, I think we can afford to ask ourselves those five questions. There are changes within LHH uh, going on at the moment. And so I'll be asking myself uh, some of these uh, where I want to take myself next through looking at what's worked for me and what hasn't. Let me just go here. Okay. Just looking at here. I'm just going back to in the chat function, Simon Connolly said on the career sweet spot, I've seen a similar model before, but with a, a third circle, what you get paid to do. Yes, um, I, I'm familiar with that one. The reason, the reason I've kept to two here is sometimes if we put the pay over the top about how much we want or uh, and, and that question, it can occlude maybe what we really want to do. Um, don't forget with Simon Sinek's circle, um, golden concentric circles, he talks about why I do what I do. Some people say, well, I get paid for it. That's an outcome of, of why you do what you do. But to really check into what drives you is important, which brings us on to my next point, which is looking at how you're unique. What are your interests? What are your values? And what's your personal style? For time, I'm just going to move forward. So I want to look at career activity number one. Here's something you might want to do. This is something at LHH when we do longer versions of this session. Face to face, I literally give people a pack of cards. When we do a virtual session, people complete this online. And I ask people to look at what they're interested in. If they were a, a, a suit of cards, are you interested in working with people? Are you interested in working with data, with ideas or with things? By things, we mean actually building things, you know, uh, people who work in logistics organizations or in the building trade and so on, that's important to them. And when we look at that, we can deduce some key drivers that people have. So mine will always be, I think this will stay true till if I live to be 100, will always be working with people. And I like working with ideas. I quite like working with things, I quite like building stuff as well. LHH don't know that, I'm just sharing that with them now. And um, data, less so. So let's take a look at some questions. So Marie, uh, you said, what about a combination of several things? Absolutely. Most people will get scores in all of these areas. Sometimes you get a kind of a minor one or two score, but most people have a combination of things. What you And if you get kind of very similar scores, if you get... I think there's 15 items in each. If you get eight for each, that, that's somebody at the moment who's motivated equally by all of these things that they could work on each of those to begin with. Yeah, hard to decide as got wide interests. What we do there, um, 
is to try and bring people down to what's most important to them at the moment. But then, and this is useful as well, career activity number two. You don't need the cards exercise to do this. What you might want to do for yourself, again, when it's time for you, is to create four boxes on a sheet of paper and thinking about the role that you're in at the moment, right in the engage box, what's of high interest to you that you do at the moment? And what do you think you have a high skill in? You think I'm really interested in this and I'm really good at it. So that would go in box number one. Box number two, upskill me. So you've got high interest in this area, but a low or lower skill. So that would be an area where either yourself take the initiative to get upskilled or you and the organization, your employer, take the initiative to become skilled in that area. Now, the things kind of on the bottom half of the screen, disengaged, you've got a low interest, but a high skill in something. So this might be something you've been doing for a long time. You're really skilled in it. It used to be a high motivator for you, but now you're sort of done with that. You've got a low interest in a high skill. If you had to do it too much, it might be disengaging for you. And then misaligned. These are the things that are in your role at the moment that you're doing where you've got low interest and low skill. And it's not a skill that you want to develop because you've got no interest in it. This quadrant is really useful for looking at what is motivating you right at the moment. So you might want to take a screen um, um, grab of that just to have a think about that over the next two days. I'm working with um, a company at the moment looking at a number of their, well, almost all of their enti entire uh, population, career population, uh, employee population. And this exercise, I put in uh, the face-to-face -face session, I put in about half an hour to do this exercise. It goes to an hour because people really want to drill into, especially the top right and the low left. There are very few actually in the bottom right. But this exercise might make you think, this is what I need to talk to somebody about. This is how things might want to change. So take a look at doing that. And, and whoops, a combination of what your interests are and where they are deployed can actually give you a breakthrough, one of those light bulb moments. I'm just going to go back to the chat function. Um, I took from, this is Simon, I took from the what you can get paid to do quote as a prompt to look beyond the obvious. For example, uh, moving from a corporate organization to become a fitness instructor. Maybe you're good at baking, talking to people, problem solving. Could you get paid to do any of them that might align to your values? Great. I see what you mean now, Simon. Absolutely. And th this is where you look at transferable skills. And I think that's really important at the moment as people are thinking about portfolio careers, about what that actually means. Okay, so let's take a look. Not free, Andrea, not freely available. Uh, we tend to keep them with us. We can't really hand them out. But um, I think if you take the headings and then um, think about what might be underneath those things, such as with people, training people, interviewing other people, um, ideas, idea generation, solving problems, data, drilling into facts and figures, those sort of things, you can kind, you can start to, to come up with some answers. Let me just move forward. I am aware of time. If you want, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but if you want to take a look at Edgar Schein's uh, career anchors about where your perception of ability, basic values, and, uh, and so on might be, these are good. Lifestyle, technical and functional, general management, autonomy, pure challenge, security, entrepreneurial creativity, service or cause. It's not a right or wrong. It is. It just is. And I've given you the, let me just I'll bring all these up now, just for time. I've given you some of those definitions as well. This can kind of clarify things that you're interested in a moment in a bit greater detail than maybe the interest cards. However, what I do want to get to is boosting your own confidence. So employees that organize Organizations which allow them to play to their strengths are 17% more engaged and are 36% more productive. So do you know your strengths and passions and what you bring to the workplace? Of course, Julie. Julie just wanted to go back a slide. I'll just go for 
a second. Is that the slide, Julie? Okay, one second, Julie. Absolutely. Yes, Nikki, the slides will be shared. I tell you what, just for time, I'll just move forward. Sorry, Julie, I'll just move forward for time. You will get them. So knowing your strengths and what you bring to the workplace, I think is key. And this can help you. Now, I, I used to recommend a, a model like this purely for interview techniques. But I think it's actually more than that. And I've noticed this during the lockdown as well, especially right at the start of lockdown, when people's resilience was called into question and we were feeling a bit bashed and bruised, and many people still are. Having a model that can look at what you're proud of and how you show up for work, I think is important. It's important for our mental well-being, but it's also important as a way of bringing to life what is on your CV. So, we start with the situation and the obstacles a particular incident at work um, gave you. So I could say if I went back a few years, um, a situation, there weren't really, there were some obstacles that I faced was to designing a global uh, management training program that had to hit uh, certain financial and quality criteria and would need to be delivered uh, in various different languages and would take quite a few facilitators both to deliver it and be brought up to speed in the way we trained them. So that the situation, the obstacles would be the client's uh, finances, the actions. So I, then I would go through all the actions that Russell took as the senior uh, lead on that, pro on that prog project. Um, I resolved this, I analysed this, I took these actions, so on and so forth. And then, and this is the part that people miss out, but is the most important to specify the results and the overall impact to the department, the customer, or the organization. And it is no good just saying, and we did a great job and everybody was happy. Because think about it, when you go for your next job interview, the reason they're asking you that question is, how can you help us? What sort of issues do we have that you can help us solve and what makes it valuable for us. So I talked about kind of leapfrog promotions that the client got from the program that we, um, we initiated and, and ran for about five years, so on and so forth. The dollar value that that saved them from recruiting externally. It takes some time, but if you can do that, that starts to deal with, somebody mentioned about an imposter syndrome here. I think if you get enough source stories together, the process of writing those source stories, source stories actually begins to dilute that imposter syndrome perspective. That said, you, you need to have more than one or two. This is what I do. Um, clearly, I won't show uh, you mine today, but I have a spreadsheet that looks at the sort of competencies that are required for a role like mine, or in the future, a role I might want to have, and I can do research into what that, the competencies, what that might look like. So I then, so those are across the top on the horizontal line. And the vertical is all my different source stories. Now, I wouldn't call them saw one, saw two, I'd call them such and such client, and this, that, and the other client, an ABC client, and so on and so forth. And then I map through for each of those source stories, which competency is of particular value. And then when it comes to looking at interview preparations or just building up my self-confidence, if I've had you know, a difficult week or a difficult day, I go back to those sto source story grid and review it. And that in itself, there's something I, I need to go back to, and that in itself can indicate what are my other transferable skills as well. So if we go back just here, if you get enough source stories and you start to look at the results column, 
And then you start to look at the commonalities with the results column. It can often say things about you and about who you really are and what your real true skills are. And it goes into that behavioral level. So I love source stories. They give us confidence. They remind us of who we are, but they can also look at um, how we are how we might be employable in the future. The reason I pause there is I was coaching somebody who worked at a big pharmaceutical organization. This was a few years ago. And she said, I don't have any source stories. Uh -huh. There's nothing at work that you've been proud of. No, not really. I have a really boring job. I just look at things going across on a conveyor belt and, and uh, that's it. And I said, okay. So was there ever a time at work when you, you did something that was unusual, not wrong, but unusual? She said, yeah, there was one night where, because I watched the, the conveyor belt going past and I watch all the labels on the, the pharmaceutical boxes and I watch all that. There was one night where there was quite clearly a problem with the labels sticking onto the thing and they were all wrinkled. And I said, so what did you do? She said, I pressed the red button. I said, oh, what's the red button? She said, well, it stops production. And you only do that if things are really bad. And I thought this was really bad. So, okay, so what did that feel like? Well, it was part of my job and I had to do it, this, that, the other. I said, but as you pressed the button, what did you think about? She said, I thought about my daughter. And this is a real source story plus. This is a transferable skill, so the R plus. I said, tell me why you thought about your daughter. She said, my daughter's been unwell. She's better now, but my daughter was unwell. And as I pressed that button I thought if I were a parent and I was trying to read the label of what this medication was and I couldn't read it and I was unsure about giving it to my child I thought about all the other parents who might be in that position if this was a, a medication to be given to a child or to anyone and that's what I thought so I said then what's the real skill what's the real transferable skill you've got there and she said I suppose I showed a lot of empathy with people I've never met. And that's exactly right. If you gather enough source stories and you look at what's underneath the results, that can actually give you great self-confidence, can start dealing with the imposter syndrome, but also becomes useful for other people in the future, um, other employ um, employee, or, uh, employee opportunities. So in the last 10 minutes or so, I think I've got another question just there. What's the alternative to career pathways? Um, I think if you mean kind of job pathways, this is a question on the question and answer. I think you mean into job pathways. I think that's dependent on the sort of business that you are. So I don't think I'd give a quick answer to that just in the last 10 minutes, but it's something if you want to get in touch, we can start to um, have a question, have a debate about afterwards. Okay. My pleasure, Marie. Oh, I'll tell you and I'll give you another transferable skill. I'm going to do this really from my heart. My mother um, died just before Christmas. She was 91. And about 1980, in the teeth of the, night, the, early, the first 1980 recession, she was made redundant. And she worked as a clerk all of her life. And she decided to apply for a job at the Birmingham Children's Hospital in the nursing home. And it would be the receptionist and looking after the nurses, the student nurses that would be there. And she went for the interview and they went through everything she got to do and asked all the questions. And they said, Mrs. Dethridge, if this were a clerking job, you'd have it right now. You'd have the job right now. But you've never done any kind of the um, pastoral care that is required for um, looking, kind of looking after the nurses when they come here, because they're only 18 or so, most of them. Where do you get that from? And she said, well, my son, that was me, my son has just gone to London. Uh, to college he's only 18 and I worry about him every day I hope I would bring the same care and attention that somebody who's looking after my son in London 100 miles away um, I hope to bring that care and concern to these sons and daughters as they would show to mine and she got the job and uh, I think that's that's a true skill that's a true transferable skill and they told her afterwards that's the moment you got the job so it's understanding that. Okay, so some more things I want to share with you. 
career choices and portfolio careers. Choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. It's not what you achieve, it's what you overcome. Work to become, not to acquire. Find out what you like doing best and get someone to pay you for doing it, as uh, I think somebody touched on earlier on. Thanks, Simon. So the world of work has changed. Career agility, dynamic teams, role agility structured around projects rather than rank, experimentation and responsibility, and then people generation, um, working in a global matrix and so on. Thank you, Manisha. So these are the things, I think this is the way things are working. And this portfolio career idea has started to gain traction in the last, I would say last year, certainly, maybe a bit longer than that, since the, um, since the, where's something gone? Yeah, since the, uh, the pandemic. So as we look at our main choices, as we look at our career options, we might want to think about how things are moving. Is it the same job in the same area of business, same job in a different area of the business, a different job, the same area of business, and a different job with a different area of business? So when you're looking at this, and we'll share these slides with you afterwards, when we're looking at this and you're looking at the future, you might want to think, what is next for you? And there might be kind of consider different career options. I'm just going to stop sharing something because, no, I'll just carry on with this at the moment. I can come back to it later. You might also want to look at um, considering different career options, such as a lateral move or an enrichment move. An enrichment move is where you stay where you are, but you become a subject matter expert, as it were. So as I look at LHH's uh, changes towards the end of this year and into next, I might, to, I might want to move into an enrichment piece. I'll stay in the same role, senior principal consultant, but actually maybe become a subject matter expert. Or I could go into exploration, stay where I am, but adding lots and lots of things to my portfolio. Realignment. Uh, sometimes people are stepping back from where they are, that portfolio career, moving from five days a week to maybe four, maybe three, and with the other two uh, days doing something that they have always wanted to do, as long as it's not in direct conflict with their main employer. The vertical move is, as it sounds, moving up the key, the um, hierarchical ladder, and relocation. Relocation can mean two things. Yes, it can mean leaving the business. It can also mean leaving a geographical part of the business, but staying in the same um, organization, but moving to another geography. Let me just take this. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Tetridge, thank you, Simon. I've seen this shown as career lattice work worth a look on Google, absolutely. So um, also known as career webs, instead of having uh, career ladders, it's known as career webs and, and moving in all directions. So let me just bring this up. So here we are, career development, awareness of wider context. So we talked about this area, self-awareness, what is driving you, but also external awareness. One of the things we look at right at the end of the longer versions of this, these sessions is what is going on in the world that will have a direct impact on the sort of work or the sort of industry that you work in. And people rarely think about that. And I think it's crucial. It's not good enough for us to, just to be skilled for this year. We've got to be skilled for two years time. It's like preparing for the previous Olympics if you're an athlete or a sports person, you're preparing for the next tournament as well. And then portfolio careers. I'll just let you look through that. My nephew is 30. He's studying his doctorate at Edinburgh University, which is coming to an end this summer. But I think the way I, he talks to me is he will have a portfolio career. He'll probably own, he won't mind me saying this, he'll probably eventually own a whiskey bar. That will be one piece. That's what he likes to do. But also he will lecture at a university, wherever, wherever he is. 
I would imagine he'll also have something else that he's interested in as well. And those three things will overlap somewhat in terms of their skills, but they will be separate to each other. And if I look at his friends, that generation, early 90s, that's how they're viewing their world, world of work. Um, many of his friends are starting to look at that, things that are complementary, so he can kind of flex from one to the other. However, there are some pros. It gives you that work-life balance if you're in charge of that. It gives you diverse skill sets. It gives you an extra cash flow. You can have a passion pursuit. You can test drive different careers and maybe protects your future if you're looking at those various um, choices. There's also somebody I'm coaching in Turkey. She's going through exactly the same. She's just working out what is right for her. Her and her, her friend are setting up a couple of business ventures and ideas. Yeah. Um, Maria makes that point in the chat function that there are slashers, but because people are under resource, that's not quite the same thing because the people involved in that um, are required to do this rather than um, choose to do it. Oops. But some cons, the balance between those different portfolios may be elusive. If some of them require you to be self-employed, the benefits might be lacking. There's a different approach, maybe not less chance, there's a different approach to how you see advancement. And if you're somebody that requires that security of known advancement, that might not work for you. It's increasingly but not widely embraced yet. Two years ago, I'd say it was not widely embrace, embraced, but now it is starting to do so. I think as people have come out of the pandemic, they've started to think, this is what I want to do with my career. So that's what I wanted really to talk to you about. I'm just aware of the last two minutes. I think when you're looking at who to speak to in terms of your stakeholder management, you could do worse than take a look at this uh, grid. So people in each of these areas, whether it's kind of in terms of their influence over where your career goes and the level of commitment support they can give you, thinking about where you can find support and find guidance, you may want to look at uh, these particular areas here. High level of influence, low level of commitment and support. Um, are there in people in box two that could help you? Box two clearly being the most powerful for us. And maybe box three, where there's low level of influence and low level of commitment, the people who sit there, you may not need to utilize. But high level of commitment support and low level of influence, these are people you can turn to to give you that bolster, that boost. So my, my best friend, David, well, best man at my wedding, I've known for 40 years this year works in a different, completely different industry to me, but he can give me that support. Okay. And then finally, some conversation readiness. What am I asking for? What does great look like for me? What's my brand at the moment? What are my strengths? What are my shortcomings? Okay. So that, just um, for time, is what I wanted to look at with you today. Now, I'm sorry, we had so many questions earlier on, I couldn't quite get to all of them, so I apologise for that. But I trust it's been informative and useful. I'm going to stay on for a few moments for any more questions. You can put them in the chat function or you put them in the Q&A. So I'll just sit here for a while. Thank you, Jane. So if you've got any questions, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm just going to keep an eye on the Q&A. My pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Let's see what we've got in the Q&A. Somebody asked um, earlier on about how would you advise someone who's having a difficult relationship with their manager and feels like they can't speak with them about it. I think at that point, first of all, I would try and look at what is the nature of the, the disconnect, because I don't, I'd, 
I'd always try and go to the, the, two, the two main uh, parties in that disconnect, first of all. I think if you really feel like this isn't for you, I would say talking to somebody at, in HR purely confidentially, I think that would be the, the first way to do it. I, would, I wouldn't go, so if, if this is your line manager, I wouldn't go to their line manager. I wouldn't do that leapfrog. I'd go kind of sort of sideways into another area. He's doing so the best way to look at different in industry completely. My job is nothing to do with my degree. I don't necessarily enjoy it, but I don't know what it is that I want to do. Okay, so somebody's just asked me that question there. Um, SOAR is one way of doing it. I would say you can either use kind of a version of the interest cards. If you don't, clearly you may not have the interest cards, get yourself a pack of post-it notes. And one evening with uh, a beverage of your choice, just sit down and write all the things you like doing. One, one item per post-it note and just put them down in a big pile. And then all the things you don't like doing and try and be really specific about the things you don't like doing. So if you put down admin, specifically what it is about admin because some roles will always require admin and then i lay them all out on my living room uh, dining room table and then i'd write down what stops me doing the things that i'm wanting to do is that skills is it knowledge is it attitude they usually come into those three areas it is likely it is going to be the attitude pile that would be biggest so then you have to take or you can take the areas that you're interested in and look at how if you change some perspective on attitude, whether that's kind of a positive mental attitude or uh, setting things up to get things done. If you put those two things together, it can actually you can start to see your way through. So. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Christina. And we've got some others. Let me go through. So still about 50 people on, losing time in order to get trained, gain new experience or gain new skills in case of a change in career. How to overcome the idea of losing time. Let me go back here. So Karen, thank you for your question. This is, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, sometimes we do have to. This is the famous Simon, uh, Stephen Covey quote about walking through a wood and he sees this person and they're, car they're, they're, they're the, the tree cutter, they're carving down the, the woods and they're pulling, pulling, pulling. And of course, the more, the harder they work and they're chopping down these trees, the blunter the saw gets. And Simon, Stephen Covey says, why don't you stop um, and sharpen the saw and then you'll be more efficient afterwards. And the woodcutter says, I can't do that because I'm too busy cutting the wood. I think sometimes we have to bite the bullet and step back and say, I need to get retrained. I need to get to stop and really think about what I want to do, because otherwise you will have that just going with the flow and regret not kind of retraining. I, I th I'm afraid putting that extra work in is th there isn't a magic way of avoiding that. OK. OK, so I've just come back to when it's in the, the HR department itself, the uh, the question about the, the line manager and so on. If there is an HR for HR, you might want to turn to those if, if there is one. Let me just see what other questions you have. Okay. Thank you very much, Marianne. Just trying. Um, uh, Diana uh, mentioned this. What about feeling you're stacked in your career and you feel like you need a career break? Remember when I talked about the, the, the different choices people have in their career and realignment was one of them. That is quite normal. So stepping back from that, it, one of the first things people will say is, I can't afford to do that. I would say, yes, I fully respect that. However, sometimes you have to look at how much money you need as opposed to how much money you want and make a distinction between the two in order to step back so that you go from five days to three days or you go. I was coaching somebody who was an HR director and she was an HR director, very senior for many, many years. And with personal life and with professional life, she just became burnt out. 
and I was working with her and we I was coaching her and it was her idea she said what I'm going to do is I'm going to step back and I'm going to take a, a demotion of about three levels because what I need to do is not work so many days and be able to close my laptop laptop equiv equivalent of um, five at, at five o'clock at night just so I can deal with this she did that for two years while her family um, issues uh, became sorted and there were other things that she could deal with and that really worked for her so that uh, realignment I think is important I think I've got another question here okay let me have a look I'm just going to take one more question I'm just aware of time and I better go in a, in a moment whoops how to overcome the idea of losing time in order to get trained, gain new experience. Um, hang on a minute. Oh yeah, I think we've dealt with that. Okay. I'm just like taking a look at some of the other questions. Um, Maria, about moving jobs rapidly. I think if you do too many of it, yes. If I'm looking at a CV or a resume and I see somebody has moved three months you know every three months for the last two years i think what's going on here i think and, and this is why at interview when you're asked when you are required to ask questions i think that's it's good to to profile the potential employer as well i think if it happens once and you're up front with with why you left so rapidly that would that would be okay that's what happened to me in about 2005 2006 I mentioned before, second day in, I thought this is wrong. And I said to my mate and he was going, no, no, you're just a new boy. You'll, you'll soon get used to it. And it wasn't. I knew perfectly well. I was there for about six months then and then moved on. And at interview, I would just explain it was neither the role nor the uh, nor the environment that I was expecting. So, Manisha, hi, Russell, do say a few words on retraining by selecting professional courses versus mainstream schooling for changing careers. Oh, absolutely. This is, if I'm taking that question in the right way, this is about being, I talked earlier about skills, knowledge and attitude that might be holding people back. If it's a, a specific skills area that needs addressing, that's where, um, however you get the funding, whether it's your em employer partly funding it or yourself fully funding it, whatever it is, building that those skills and potentially that knowledge, I think you have to do. So there's uh, uh, architecture uh, or uh, organization we work with, they are required to do that. Now, if they're gonna move into a completely different field, that's gonna take some uh, financial input and, and quite a lot of effort. But if you know that that's the area that you want to work in, I think that's a good thing to do. Okay, so it's just about eight minutes past the hour and I've lost the camera, there it is. So, let me take this down. I think we're down to just about 30 people now. I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time today. We'll send you the deck. It's been great to be with you. Sorry about the mishap on the um, taking you off mute and uh, working with the, the annotate. Didn't know about the annotate, but uh, never mind. So thank you very, very much and um, hope to be in touch with you very soon. Thank you and goodbye.